Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. I'm Christina Catane, and I write in multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction under the pen name D.D. Bowman. Awesome. So we want to give a big thank you to our viewers, our chatters, and our listeners. I think probably listeners on podcasts um, are a much bigger number than the other two categories. And we just want you to know that we love you and we appreciate you and we would love to hear from you. So you can reach us on email, any social media, and um, yeah, just get a hold of us, like us, subscribe, uh, comment, leave us a review. That would be awesome. Shell says, good morning. Good morning, Shell. Gigi's giving us a, an <laughs> ovation. I don't know. Yeah. Where I think she's sure. waving her hand, maybe. Like, I think she notices she notices that we're all being extra super professional today. Like, look at us all. We're all sitting up straight and we're all like, <laughs> you know, we're on our best behavior. Give it time. Give it time. This is yeah. us every other week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We like to start each episode with a segment we call What's Up, where we go around the virtual table and each one of us just tells what's going on in their lives this week. So, Rhonda, I'm going to pick on you to go first. <laughs> no. Okay. So, what's up with me is uh, it's been a great week because even though it's been a little bit chilly here in Florida, all the people who think that 65 degrees is like Arctic here, they're not on the beach shelling. And so it's been really nice for me. Ooh, nice. So that, and then the icing on the cake is this week in West Palm Beach, there is a huge antique festival. And I'm so Ooh, excited. I'm so yeah. excited right now. <laughs> so that's and no one cool. will be at that either because I heard there's like a football game in town too. So it, oh, football. Really? A football they have game. in Florida this weekend? So, yeah. I don't know. Something rumor has it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, and what about you, Jennifer? Well, um, I we're supposed to keep this short because we want to have more time for Becca and less time of us, but I have just one thing to say. I finished editing book three. <gasps> yeah! Wow! Yay! Good job! So, awesome. so like, I, I finished the this, this round of edits, so now it's really ready just to go into paperback version and get it to my copy editor. So, so happy to be done with this book. Good so. for you, Jennifer. That's hey. really something that you've been carrying around for a long time, like way before Christmas. I'm so oh, glad. Yeah, huge weight around my neck. So Jason, hi, how are you doing today? Piper, good morning, Piper. And oh, I'm getting, yay. Hooray, Jen. Woohoo, Jen. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Jennifer, Lady. your plant looks so business-like today. I, I was wondering if someone was going to notice. <laughs> I decided, I, I don't think I told this in the podcast, I think I mentioned it in the live streams, the writing streams, um, that since I can't move it out right now, I'm just going to keep dressing it because it's, it's not a dead plant. It's Uncle Fred, who's mm -hmm. clearly a, a Bruins fan. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I like the cowboy hat better. <laughs> oh, there's more to come. <laughs> okay, what about you, Jamie? What's up with you? Well, I have sort of a mix of a praise report and a prayer request. I don't want to really name names, but in my family, we have um, a history of breast cancer and we did have a scare and we did have someone in my family go in and have a surgery and the surgery went really well. So all okay. the lymph nodes were removed and things like that. So I would like for you guys, if you would just pray, I will just say pray for Kay um, and just be in prayer because, you know, it makes our whole family a little bit scared when that particular topic comes up. But because things went so well today, we want to praise God for that. So pray for Kay and thank you, God, for a good outcome today. The surgery was just this morning already? Yeah, she's already been through it. Yeah. Okay. Piper says my what's up last scene being written today and shipped to editor and I have a beta listener already going <gasps> on for a book. That's oh. exciting. Way to go, Piper. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to go now for my what's up. And I just have to say that the last couple of weeks have been really emotional for me. Um, I have been on a roller coaster between mm -hmm. elation and this sitting and crying because um, I have become a Clifton Strengths geek. <laughs> yes. And I think it's, I, 
I honestly think it's because of the whole adoption thing. And oh. like my whole life, I've just had this deep longing to know who I am. Oh. And this, this thing has, um, it ranks right up there for when I found like my biological siblings oh. and like learned that, you know, I could trace my ancestors now back to La Mancha, Spain on my father's side and um, Vikings in, on, um, in Loki's expedition on my mother's side. So um, yeah, it's just been really emotional. And um, that is like a segue, a perfect segue to introduce today's topic. We are, we have a very special guest that I'm really excited about and I'm trying not to be nervous, um, but it's Becca Syme and she is a Gallup certified strengths coach with over 14 years of coaching success alignment systems. She's a fiction author, and as a fiction author, she realized that her success coaching could be helpful to fellow creatives, and she started the Better Faster Academy in 2015 to help authors write better, faster. She's recently released a series of nonfiction books for authors based on her success coaching methods called the Quit Books for Writers, and she is the host of the YouTube channel called The Quit Cast, and that's how I found her. Um, Becca lives with her wine drinking cat in the Rocky Mountains, where it is always winter <laughs> and never Christmas. So, welcome, Becca. Yay, welcome. We are so Hello. happy to have you here. I'm so excited. I wish I was joking about always winter and never Christmas. And then, of course, this morning, what does it do? It snows again. Ooh, it's yeah. no shock. No <laughs> shock. But, yeah. So, well, I'm snowed in. Oh, wow. Um, Oh, okay. wow. yeah. no, no. Mm. So is this our first two-hour podcast? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got, don't worry, I can't drive anywhere. So I also haven't had coffee yet this morning because I couldn't get out to go to Starbucks. So yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Well, Becca, our awesome chat is already welcoming you. Gigi, she's one of our famous cheerleaders. I wonder what Gigi's number one is. It's got to be a woo. Hi, Gigi. I would say woo. Welcome, Becca. Yeah. Piper is a ray. Oh, yeah. and Piper's giving a shout out to Teresa's live stream, I guess. So anyway, yay, Becca, welcome. And yeah. I'm going to go mute so it's not too many live mics. I think Piper is a student of yours right now. Yeah. 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 Um, so why don't we start out by you explaining exactly what Strengths Finder is to those who don't know? So there was a guy back in the 60s and 70s who had noticed that when he would coach people in their success, he was a psychologist, um, that there were some patterns to how different people were successful. And so he wondered, and I think it really started off as a wondering, is there a pattern? Like, is there something to you seem to have success this way, but these people have success in a very different way. And so he did a ton of research. Um, he eventually got on staff at Gallup uh, and, and that's kind of become, you know, the center of strengths right now. Mm -hmm. um, but initially it was, if there was a way to see how people were similar in their success patterns, could we help them to not worry about trying to be successful like other people and then instead just have them be successful in the way that they should be. Because there's, of course, a lot of, um, and this is how I got into it, there's a lot of advice out there about what you should do right. in order to be successful. And I'm sure we've all heard all of the shoulds uh, from all of the productivity gurus out there. Uh, and so it's, it's really trying to find a way. And so anyway, so they did this research. They found that there were these 34 distinct patterns. They interviewed 2 million of the most successful people in the world. Wow, at the time. 2 million. Mm -hmm. And they're, and they're continuing to, to interview more. So like they continue to revalidate the research okay. all the time um, just to see if there's any shift in the pattern. And so uh, the, the pattern emerged, they found 34 strengths and then they created the assessment to tell which strengths you have. So everybody has some, everybody has strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get your top five. And that's what the language that we use is your top five. So these are then the five ways that I can expect near consistent, perfect performance from you or near perfect, consistent performance from you. Uh, and everybody's different. So ev literally everyone has a different top five. I think it's one in 300 and or 33.4 million people will have the same one to 34 Ooh, order. So it's an extremely unique uh, personality metric because the whole point is 
not to find out necessarily how similar everybody is, but to find out how different everyone is. Well, individualization is in my top five and that Mine really too. appeals to me. Does that appeal yeah. to you, Rhonda? Do you get excited about that? Because that's in your top five. I love that concept of it being success is a different path for everybody. Do you like that, yes. Rhonda? Yes. yes. <laughs> and you know, it's true, right? Like innately individualization would say, oh, you're right. Like, I don't wake up at four o'clock in the morning and yet I'm super productive, but yet all of the gurus say, if you don't wake up at four o'clock in the morning, you don't really care about right. life. And I'm yes. like, but don't you like, yes, yes. that's my thing, right? Is question the premise. <laughs> like yeah. they, we give this advice and then I question the premise. So, uh, but that's where that's the basics of strengths. Nice. Awesome. Okay. So how can strengths help us to work together? as a group. So yeah, some background so, information real quick too, Becca, yeah, that we didn't tell you is that we started off with just a writing group. We were in a NaNoWriMo group and Rhonda reached out to all of us and said, Hey, I, you know, I, I write Christian too. Do you want to come to my house and tell a little writing group? And then it kind of progressed. And then Jamie moved away. Well, we had to find a way of keeping up with Jamie. So that's how the podcast was formed. So we are in essence, a writing group at the bare minimum of, of us. Nice. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So how do you work together best, the four of you? Yeah. Right. Right. So what I would then, and and I'm so glad that Tina put this together. I'm assuming it was Tina for me, where she put each of your top five oh. uh, next to each other in a spreadsheet and then sent it to me. So what I would do then if I was going to come in and do uh, coaching with this team is I would say, you know, we talk about things like, what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish uh, together? And then we would talk about what each person values and we put that in the language of strength. So for instance, just looking at your uh, top five, Fives. There's a lot of green in your top fives, which is the strategic thinking strengths. So thinking smart is a big priority for people who have a, a lot of green strengths. So having the best information, sharing resources, like one of the big pieces of why an input, for instance, which a lot of you have in common would do something like this is to be helpful. Right. So being able to know that we're all gathering different resources, maybe each of us maybe has a specialty in the things that we really love to talk about. And then I'm bringing all of that here to the group so that we can be a smarter working group. And then acknowledging that and praising it and knowing that that's your success pattern is a big deal because then you stop expecting yourself to be like other people. Um, you may yes. not be the people who are going to you know, like push and drive and, and whatever, or you might, right? Like, cause there are some of you who have high executing strengths as well. So, but it's, for me, it's all about uh, what does each of the strengths mean to what do you value in the work that you do together and having really open conversations about it. And then also it's not going to be the same as each other. Like you're each going to have slightly different values, which means that your actions might be slightly different. What you hope to get out of it, what success looks like is slightly different for each of you. And so being able to have those open conversations, like so much of it for me, and I know, uh, I think it was Jamie that had communication, right? Or Jen has yeah. a number one communication. So for communication people, and this is in my top 10, so much conflict comes out of not communicating uh, well or effectively. So if you can know, I don't mean the same thing as a relator means when I say the word friend, right? Like when I say my friend, Jen, mm -hmm. as a woo, I mean something totally different from what a relator says when I yes. say my friend, Crystal or Terry. And, and there's tension there because we don't mean the same thing and we don't always know it. So acknowledging that both of those are good, like it's good for a woo to talk about friends the way they do, but it's also good for a relator to talk about friends and they mean different things. And that's important, right? Um, yes, because my that. daughter is, um, she's just coming into her adolescence or whatever. And as she's trying to navigate friendships, I'm noticing her personality traits are just not woo-ish, right? And she yeah. has a lot of woo-ish kind of friends. And she's like, what's wrong with me? And I'm saying, baby, it's nothing wrong with you. You're just a different kind of friend. And trying, to, Yes. And so um, it's really been eye-opening to help me parent as well. So I just really am appreciative for all this work that was done. I have yeah. a question and there's a question in the mm -hmm. chat too, but um, 
so I do not share a single thing with Jennifer. And um, <laughs> I think the other two might share one, but is it unusual or common for a small group like this to have one person with these traits and then like, um, you know, Tina and I, we're the learners, the inputters and all that. So would there be more of our types in a small group like this? Or is no, it usually, usually you'll be very different. And to kind of pick up the question Barbara had about what do the colors mean? Like the four domains are uh, strategic thinking, relationship building, executing and influencing. Those are the four different colors. So they've grouped the strengths together to be similar so that you could say, for instance, like, oh, I see a lot of green strengths. And so that probably means this. But the difference is, when you have a chemistry with people, it's usually because you have something that they don't have, right? So like when you have a friendship with someone, it's usually that um, like uh, like when you get married, your spouse is usually the opposite from you. And it's because they compliment you, right? So what, because what you're we- Because cogs, you're cogs in a machine, right? And you have to fill right. each other's gaps, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and to me, the, the, the most common thing that I see is in teams that work really well together and that succeed in the long term, they kind of cover all of the bases, right? Like they'll have some way to influence, some way to execute, some way to think smarter, th some way to relate. And then they, they kind of have all of that well-roundedness in terms of as a team together, individually, it doesn't matter what colors you have, like there's no uh, indicator to that. But well, that's what Tina said. She said, thank goodness we have someone with some woo because right. only Jennifer has woo in her top five. Right. Yes. Yeah. Because if it wasn't her idea to do the podcast, I'm telling you, I would not be on yep. a podcast anywhere. That's a great example too of that strength leading. Like a woo communication would always be thinking about like how can we impact, how can we uh, message, how can we help and 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 influence. And then if you have a uh, a lack of those influencing strengths, then it has to come from somewhere else, and that can be sort of a, a roll of the dice because you never know if somebody maybe had a podcast background or something like that. But the influencing strengths are it, trying to have impact. Like, oh, we have a great thing going here. Let's share this message. Let's help other people. Uh, let's get the message out there. And so that's what influencing strengths serve. It's also why they're the least common because mm. you don't need a lot of influencing strengths in a group. You really only need a little bit um, in order to make it effective. And so influencing, like m the majority of people have all yellow at the bottom, all of those influencing strengths at the bottom. Um, so then when you have that one person who's high in a lot of influencing strengths, then they kind of get to be that person uh, who who pushes us outward. And as you're talking, I keep thinking about what you're talking about, like influencing others and helping others. I think that all four of us would agree that there have been lots of like little successes along the way. And really, we didn't expect this this podcast would really become anything. <laughs> like we just were going to keep in touch with each other. But the thing that I think that gets all four of us the most jazzed is when we help someone else. When we have a listener respond and say, or email us or message us and just say like how we impacted them, like that makes it all worth it. All the hard work, all the headaches and everything for us. So when what's so cool is that that comes from a different place at each one of you also. So like inputs, like both uh, Tina and Rhonda both have high input. Uh, I do Jamie, too, believe it or not. Yeah. And, and you have high input yeah. and Jamie is a, a in individualization Becca, and a it restorative. Feels like a win. It feels like a win they for me. Becca. Like, to solve problems. Like, I, like I strategize to make people feel something and I did it. Yeah, that's how yep. it feels to me. It doesn't feel like an altruistic. Yay, I did something nice for God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just being honest. Yeah, it's an execution thing, right? Because yeah. you lead with your restorative. And so having all of those different parts of that team is really important. But then you also have like, for instance, Tina has all in her top five, all strategic thinking strengths. So like, she's the one who's going to get obsessed with the topics. Like strengths is a great example, right? Like I, I learn about it, high context. I want to know everything I can know, high input. I want to gather all the resources so we can share them. And then ideation, like I want to create, I want to make something happen because I know all this information. So just knowing how unique and different each one of you are, like a, a 
let me answer Piper's question really quick. Uh, it's red. Yeah, <laughs> they used to be red. Uh, they went through a change because of um, uh, ADA. They were trying to be more visually uh, uh, for, for the visual impaired. Um, but I wanted to transition into saying um, the way that I came to strengths is very similar to what Tina shared about knowing who you are. Yeah. Like I had grown up in a household where my mom, dad, and sister were all like each other. Mm. Wonderful, amazing family, best family ever. I love them to death. But my growing up years as a teenager, I struggled with figuring out who I was because I have a strength called significance where I really wanted to be like, like I wanted them to think that I was smart. I wanted them to think that I was good and that, uh, and it was hard for me because I would get feedback that would be like, but you don't act like us. So we don't understand you. Mm -hmm. So I would get kind of not marginalized intentionally, but just unintentionally marginalized by my family a lot. Cause they didn't get how I worked. And I had a coaching experience in grad school at 24 years old, where I walked into this coaching hour, one person, just totally like, it was like a conversion experience. Yeah. I thought I was dumb. I thought I would never be successful. I thought I was an idiot, you know, like just totally walked in one way and came out <clears throat> being like, oh my gosh, I was right. I'm totally different and it's okay. And I was made this way for a reason and I have a calling and all this stuff. So it was like, a, it was the closest I've ever come to conversion because I grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just felt like I had to tell everybody about this because when you can be expected to be yourself and you have a capacity to you have a capacity to be excellent exactly the way that you are and somebody doesn't want to change you. There's something so validating and like God centered, I think about that. Amen. Feeling yeah. That I just can't, like, I want everybody to feel this way. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. Yeah. That's so the, the, the thing is Becca, um, I, don't think that I came out with a very likable personality. And it's the, the more authentic I am, the the less people like me. So I had to learn mm -hmm. woo. Do you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's what's a struggle for me. Well, it's been a struggle with me because I felt like I was a two-faced person my whole life. So when I learned that it was just the strategic person in me learning how to do the woo, I was able to forgive myself for being what I thought was fake. But that's not mm. what I was doing. I was just trying to make sure that I had friends because, frankly, yeah. I was a know-it-all and a rule follower and a demerit police person because I'm a strategist and I can see disaster coming a mile away. I told my husband, it's like standing on the shore and watching those big ships from the olden days come in and seeing that they're going to crash and explode into a million pieces. And you try to tell people, I see this coming and they just don't hear you because you have no woo. You have zero influence. It's a really frustrating way to live. So I had to learn how to be heard and to be heard, you have to be an influencer. And it was horrible because I felt so fake. I'm so glad that I've been validated that I'm not a fake person. And now I can let some of that unlikable person out a little bit. <laughs> well, and like knowing why that happens, like this, our tagline is anybody can tell you what worked for them and they can tell you it might not work for you, but they can't tell you why I can tell right. you why. Like the why is important yeah. because why you are not liked as a, let's say a young person, as a high restorative, when you point out problems, you're trying to be helpful, right? right? When you tell someone, hey, stop doing this or you're going to get in trouble. Hey, stop doing this or you're going to hurt yourself. Like that restorative is trying to be helpful, but people don't always take it that way. Right. Because restorative is one of the lower commonly occurring strengths in the 34. And so not a lot of people have it. So other restorative people would hear you talk and be like, She's just trying to help you. What are you getting mad at her for? But because not everyone understands that trying to help someone solve their problems and think critically is a form of help and good uh, and good behavior, they would judge that behavior as right. being 
negative or critical or angry and they don't see that restorative as a gift that you have to know where the problems are so you can fix them because we want to transform and restore and those are all again those are all very religious words right yeah and then people want to tell me i'm grumpy you know what i mean right exactly (laughs) because you're trying to be helpful and i think that's the other piece too is acknowledging that when when the audience isn't hearing what you're giving them, you have to adapt how you deliver it. And that's what you did. You didn't become a fake person. You adapted your delivery strategically so that people would listen to you. Right. Like that to me is such a different thing from. So helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know it wasn't you personally, but you're the person that I have to thank because <laughs> yeah. seriously, like Tina, like you, it's been a watershed relief. I just feel so much better. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it saved my writing career because. I have been, and not just my writing career, but everything I'm trying to do in life, I try, was trying to do it with discipline. Mm-hmm. And discipline is number 32. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so I was just failure at everything because I was trying yeah. to discipline. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was just yeah. so freeing. So could you tell us a little bit how our um, strengths, how our common strengths and our different strengths are a hindrance or a help as a group? <laughs> Yeah, and actually this gets at the question that Teresa is asking also about how MBTI or Enneagram are different from strengths. And this, uh, how to help a group specifically is where I think strengths excels over any other program because it is, it's so nuanced in a way that no other program is nuanced. So most personality tests are built so that someone decides there are nine types of people out there, or there are four types of people. Like one person has decided that there are four types of people out there, and then they create a rubric for it, and it might resonate absolutely, but it's not individualized enough to be predictive right? So where some of the, let's say, less nuanced personality tests can break down is in being 100% predictive. Wow. Whereas with strengths, because it's so nuanced, again, one in 34 million is the how how much it takes to find someone who thinks exactly like you, right? So if I can understand exactly how you think, so for instance, uh, a low discipline and a high input is very different from an input discipline. So knowing that as a coach, then I know that I can't expect certain things, even though like, let's say in an Enneagram or Myers-Briggs, you might be a five or a six, right? In in Enneagram, or you might be an INTJ in the Myers-Briggs, but then you share that particular trait cluster with, let's say, seven and a half million people. (laughs) And so the bell curve of how predictive that seven and a half million people is going to be, it's not accurate enough. And and again, it's not accurate enough for me. It's, it's plenty accurate for other people and they use it effectively. And I love that they do it. It's awesome. But for me, I want a hundred percent success rate. If somebody sits down and coaching with me, I want to be able to help a hundred percent of people. And I've found that the predictiveness of looking at someone's full 34 strengths because of the veracity of the actual psychometric and also because of the way it was created because it was created by studying successful people who already had proven that they were successful. And then they studied how that success could happen and consistently predictively happen. Uh, and they, and then they systematized it. Right. So instead of me deciding, this is the individualization in me, right. It's the, I want everything to be very unique. So when I look at a team and I see like you all have input in common, for instance, somewhere. And my guess is with Jamie, that your input is somewhere in your top 15, just listening to you talk would be my guess. So let's say I come on as coach, as a coach, and I'm like, oh, you all have input. And that means that you all like to gather information and you all, you know, et cetera. But then the flip side of that is you have to execute on the information that you gather or you have to deliver it somehow. So then we want to make sure that somebody has an influencing or an executing strength. 
uh, like Jen's activator, for instance, or Jamie's restorative, uh, or those of you who have like a belief strength, because I think everybody had some purple somewhere. Um, so we want to look at how do we balance that very strong talent of input that you all have, gathering resources, sharing resources, being helpful. But then we also want to make sure somebody's pushing us into action so that there is a, an execution push at some point or like that activator catalyst push. Like, let's get it done. Let's go do it. Let's not talk about it anymore. Right. It's important so, because Jennifer might then feel like she's being bossy or mean to right. us because we might be reluctant to do something that she thinks is a good idea for us. Exactly. But we are like, no, we don't want to do that because it doesn't sound fun to us. So it's good for yeah. her to know that she should nudge us because we are just naturally not thinking the way that she would be thinking about it. I think it's yeah. good for everyone else to understand it too. So that when I, my activator comes out, like they understand it's my activator come out. It's not me like being upset with anybody. This is just who I yeah. am. Right. Right. Um, it seems exactly. to me like the uh, Meyer Briggs, like that could be the main outline points of your personality. And then the Clifton strengths, it just seems like to fill everything in. Like more like yes, DNA, Rhonda, DNA right? In the shells. Yeah, it's like, how are you going to actually execute your success? Like, how is your success going to happen? So I always explain Myers Briggs as um, it's a baseline, big picture environmental personality test. Like, in any individual setting, uh, how, what role I play right? Like the Kiersey Bates model with Myers-Briggs, where it's like the different archetypes that, that they have. What role I play is really important. So who's the teacher? Who's the strategist? Who's the whatever, right? But strengths is a very specific, me as an individual, where can you expect the best from me? What am I going to consistently deliver for you? And that's something that no other program can do because they're all focused on personality traits, which is very different. Personality traits can change, but success patterns don't change. Like, and I, I can see this. My niece is three and a half years old. Um, she is an input somewhere. I know it because I've seen it in her from a baby. She will sit down and read the encyclopedia. I was the same way. I'm number one input. As soon as she learned how to read, she wanted to literally know everything. And you will just find her with her nose in the book and she'll be just reading for fun and trying to learn everything. And then she'll mm -hmm. randomly pop off with like a random Jeopardy fact that you never knew, like about horses' hooves or like the smell of an elephant mm -hmm. or something, right? And I'm like, oh, she's a little input. She's been like that since she was very first starting to talk. Like that hasn't changed in her. Because it emerged so early, it's likely to not change over time because she keeps rewarding it and she keeps like, and she gets rewarded in her environment by it. So the strengths are, are so almost innate and biological. It's like, what's your first instinct? And so the, just to give an example of this, mm -hmm. the most common thing we hear in coaching is I sit down with somebody and we look at your top five and they're like, yeah, but those are, those aren't, those aren't right. Like everybody does that. Mm -hmm. Right. I, like high, high inputs are like, but doesn't everybody just Google stuff when they're curious about it? I'm like, Oh no, honey, mm -hmm. let's have a conversation about that. Most people don't do that. Like most people don't hear about something and then immediately want to go read every resource about it. Or like for activators, most people aren't getting antsy when we're not taking action or like a high restorative. Most people are not seeing problems everywhere and wanting to fix them. Oh my goodness. And people think I'm just such a curmudgeon, but I'm yes. just trying to be so helpful. But you're trying to be helpful because you see the problems. So the lo lower your restorative is, the less likely you are to see them, but also the less likely you are to want to solve them. Right. So like that joke that I was like vanilla ice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Becca, if if yeah. you know all of this about yourself, what good does it do to know all this? Now you go find a job where you get to be restorative or what? Tell me how to make this so the, make something. There is something. some of that. It totally depends on where you are in your career and what you need, okay. right? Because there isn't a predictiveness to like, let's say um, you don't have to have a certain type of job because you're an input. Okay. Like 
And so this is what we do for writers. This is why I specifically created program yes. for writers because, okay, so Gallup and I just, I, this is one, th I told them something earlier. I'm like, I won't say this online. Uh, I won't say where we're being recorded, but there's something I will say where we're being recorded, which okay. is if you go look at the trait of communication, which is Jen's number one, and you read what Gallup says about it, they say, you might want to think about being a writer right? Like, because high communication. And I'm yeah. like, okay, statistically speaking, communication is in the bottom 10 of writers, like of mm -hmm. writers. Mm -hmm. And we've tested over 5,000 writers now. And the pattern is holding so much that it's, it's going lower. Like the communication is not rising. It's going down. The traits that we found to be more consistent among writers are actually the strategic thinking strengths because you have to think and think and think in order to produce something, right? So your creativity comes out of your brain. And so we've actually found that the predictive information that you get from the, the company, right, from Gallup, and they will say, like, it's not predictive. You don't have to be one job. Sure. But, part, but we found successful writers that have every single strength, all 34. So there is no such thing as like a, um, let's say, uh, top five strengths that writers should have doesn't exist because every single writer has a capacity to be successful in their own way and to write in their own way. It's just how are they going to do it? Like, mm -hmm. how are you going to be successful? So a high strategic restorative, for instance, is going to be successful as a writer in a super, super different way from a high communication. And, and so we see no that. Yeah, yeah, Jamie, like, now we see that. Yeah, right. Like you see that it happens, but we all because we don't have a way to quantify it. It's so important to be able to quantify it. So, for instance, let's say um, somebody comes to you with a problem about their plotting, and someone who is a plotter is giving plotting advice, but someone who's a pantser is like, "We'll just uh, just wing it." right? Like, how do you make a decision between which of those you should do? And then Becca would say, okay, go back to uh, what are your strengths? What, how do you create story? How do you best create story? And is there an answer inside of that? How are you successful that we can use to help you make decisions? So, and I'll use one that's really common among writers. The most common strength among writers is input or sorry, is intellection. Input is number three. In elections, the most common strength among writers that we've tested, which is likely to mean that it is the most common strength it, or one of the most common strengths among all writers just because mm -hmm. of the sample size. In election needs time to think and process. One of the most common pieces of advice that happens is just write the crappy draft and don't think about what you're writing. That is the worst kryptonite advice that you could give to a high intellection person. Because if you don't let intellection think, and sometimes intellection also needs to edit as they go, but that's another piece of advice that gets thrown out. Just like, don't edit as you go, just write. And a lot of intellection people are like, but hold on a second. Like, how, how can I keep going if there are all these mistakes that I keep thinking about and then they affect this and all of a sudden my story changes because I didn't edit this thing when I was writing it, right? So if you know that that's a common success pattern with you and with other writers who are also successful, who have high intellection, who still do that, then you're free to do what is natural for you to do and know that you're not hindering your success by doing that. And that's really the most important actionable stuff for me for strengths is being able to know that oftentimes the advice that you get, the best practice advice is actually not beneficial for you because you're wired in a way that doesn't support that advice. And so we have to question the premise, right? That's why we say QTP mm -hmm. all the time. People mm -hmm. say, well, writers write. And I'll be like, but do they? Like, there are plenty of writers who don't write every day. Like, if you don't write every day, doesn't mean you can't be successful, but there's this mantra out there that's like, write every day, write every day. If you're not writing, you're evil, right? And I'm like, nope, writing every day is not righteous. Let's question the premise and then look at your strengths and see if there's a way we can align you to be more successful. Yeah, Becca, and I think it's interesting how you said this is all very much um, tying into matters of faith because 
Um, your identity should be in Christ is something that the church will kind of just bandy about or throw around. And you should just be yourself is like a catchphrase that the world will just bandy about or throw around. But if you really know how God made you, when you hear things like, what was the statistic about how many people would line up to my individual person? What did you say was the statistic? One in 33.4 million. And so, really, because each of the traits are also ranked. So you rank of one to 34, but then you also have like 94% of one strength and maybe 97% mm -hmm. of another. If you go to that level, it's more like one in eight and a half billion. So wow. like you're unique among people on the planet right now. That's God. That's God. Yeah, I that's mean, it's God. the fingerprint of God all over you. And 100%. if you just understand that God put you here to do your thing. I mean, yeah. God is God is glorified through you being you, not through you trying to be Becca or you trying to be Jen or you trying to be Jamie. God is glorified through you being you. And if we can get that message out there to people, I mean, we're in the business of giving writing advice. And every time we're like, well, we just said all of this, but who are we to say that that's the way you should do it? So we just really appreciate kind of hearing from some kind of an expert that all these things we feel are just kind of true. And we love to give God the glory for all of this. Becca, yeah. can you explain the difference between um, the BP10 test and the Clifton Strengths Finder. Yes. Yeah, so BP10, and I'm so glad you brought this up because I was actually going to suggest if you are all planning to like long-term become like a business together, I would definitely take the BP10. It's a, um, so BP10 was originally created as 10 types of uh, uh, business personalities, right? Mm -hmm. So are you a rainmaker? Are you uh, a relationship expert? Are you a instigator? Are you a, you know, um, a disruptor, right? Like it's kind of more like the roles that you play in the business would be the BP10. So if you're ever in a situation where you're building a business with other people, I 100% absolutely suggest that you take the BP10. It's not as helpful um, as individuals, because it's more meant for like as a team, mm -hmm. unless as an individual, you're saying like, for instance, I'm not a rainmaker. Rainmaker <laughs> is the one who makes it rain with money, right? Like they're the ones who are always thinking about how do we monetize this? How My do we husband make money is a rain. <laughs> like I'm literally ten, 10. It's the bottom. I don't care. I Me don't either. think about money yeah. ever, but I'm running a business that needs to make money. And yeah. so I have to have some kind of a rainmaker talking to me. So <laughs> one of the first things we did when I started building my team, and now we have we have 12 people on staff at the nice. BFA now, right? Like it's amazing. But like I had to make sure that I had a rainmaker around me who would be, and she does. She is the reason that we're growing mm -hmm. because I would hide everything under the, you know, just be like, just do your business up here. I'm just going to coach people mm -hmm. and we're fine. We're fine. Right. Like I don't like all of that rainmaker stuff, but somebody has to think like that in the business. So you make sure, are you not spending money? You don't have to, are you taking good care of your resources? Are you paying your people? Well, are you doing everything you can do to make money ethically, from the people that need to be paying you for services. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have a rainmaker on your staff, then you're always going to be forgetting about that really important stewardship level uh, question. So the BP10 can really help to make sure that you're covering all of those bases, or if you don't have them, that you bring someone in to coach or mentor you who has those other uh, nice. the other ones that you don't have. It's really right. helpful for business uh, entrepreneurs though. I love yeah. that. I really hate to um, stop talking to you, Becca. That's okay. You're going to be here all day. I know. I know. Our, our time of when we- You don't have to read our I know. <laughs> and so we- come back. Oh, awesome. All right. I'm going to take you up on that. So we have the next segment. It's one of the favorites of our podcast called The Feeding of the Backs. For those of you who don't know, we got it because when we would, as a writing group, we would give feedback to each other. Jamie would always say, is your back well fed? Um, and so we decided to call this our feeding of the backs time. And so right before the podcast, we set a timer for 15 minutes. We had a random prompt we all had to use. Um, there was no time for planning, revision, uh, editing, anything like that. And so we only give positive feedback. And so we are going to start. I am going to pick on Jen to go first. 
I Yay! somehow knew that was going to happen because it's always when I write the least interesting thing it's that I have to go prompt first. today. It's you, every time you say that, it's just wonderful. No, so. no trust me. These are words. <laughs> that's, that's the extent is these are words. Okay. So today's prompt was, and 100% you can blame Christina Katain. She picked it and enjoyed it. The prompt was, and you and in quotes, quotes. So it's you in have quotes. to use it. Ugh. The whole sentence. The green tea and avocado smoothie turned out exactly as would be expected. That was your prompt today, ladies and gentlemen. And Fun. here's what here's what I did with it. The green tea and avocado smoothie turned out exactly as would be expected. Nasty. How do you find these diets? She asked Shar. Shar <laughs> glared at Denise. Quit your belly aching, Denise. You're the one who wants to lose 10 pounds before spring break, not me. Denise looked at Shar over her nearly full glass of green goop. Of course, Shar wasn't trying to lose weight. What was she, a size two? It would take three of her duct tape together to make one of me, one of her. Why did I put me? One of Denise. Okay. <laughs> Denise thought. Oh, that's right, because it's supposed to be. Sorry. See, these are not edited. That's a sprint. It's a sprint. Um, let me just start the sentence over. It would take three of her to duct tape together to make one of me, Denise thought. She sighed and tried downing her glass. She made it about halfway through when she felt it. It was returning. Denise barely made it to the sink in time before everything she had just forced down came back up with twice as much force. <sighs> and this time, it wasn't alone. Why did God have to make bile so disgusting tasting? She cupped her hands into the running water and attempted to rinse away the evidence of her weak stomach. You have to actually drink it for the recipe to, to work, you know. Char placed her now empty glass in the dishwasher. Really? Denise said, the word dripping with sarcasm. Are you sure? Because I'm pretty sure if I continue to throw up every time that stuff touches my lips, I'll probably shed weight pretty quickly. <laughs> Suit yourself, but don't expect me to hang out in the hotel the entire week with you while you hide out. I plan on spending every minute in that new bikini I just ordered. Denise pulled out her phone. Where did you order that from? Safi's. Denise typed in the address to her browser. She tapped on the menu and selected swim cover-ups and found one that she liked for $20. She purchased the cover-up and put her phone back in her pocket. Best 20 bucks I'll spend all year. Three, two, one. Yay! Why did you not like that? That was very fun. It's just words. It's like, I'm not going to build anything off. I don't know. I don't know because these characters. Because it has to be positive. I will say your bio description was very accurate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Otherwise, I would say negative feedback about your bio. Thanks, Jen. But I will <laughs> not. Tina, I see you're talking, but you're muted. You're still uh, muted. Oh. There you go. I don't know who muted me. Um, yeah, I totally felt that bio description it was so realistic very realistic good job jen <laughs> it was good seriously and it was a cute story and you didn't like mm -hmm. it. it was fun no it was totally fine it just wasn't anything i was super excited about but it was gg says totally she's fine. skipping lunch <laughs> <laughs> sorry gg <laughs> piper says jen that was awesome not just words oh, right. thank yeah. you shell says good stuff jen Blello. thank you i really appreciate that y'all <laughs> okay, I'm going to go next just so that you don't, I still have to keep hearing me talking all in a row. Um, and I thought when I saw this prompt that my thing was going to be funny. And it mm. didn't turn out that way. So oh. here we go. The green tea and avocado smoothie turned out exactly as would be expected. I pushed it away from myself on the table a bit, but not so far that anyone would notice I found it distasteful. The bell on the door jangled and a group of teenage girls entered, all giggles and whispers. I saw them looking in my direction and whispering behind their hands before breaking into an uproar of laughter. I blocked them from my mind. Childhood trauma has its perks, I suppose, like developing the ability to dissociate on a dime. Like that time on the airplane, I had squeezed myself into the ever-shrinking airline seat and started to pray. I knew the instant I saw the mean girls coming down the aisle with their Gucci bags, manicured nails, and messy updos, my prayers had been in vain. The moment mean girl number one saw she was seated next to me, she said in a loud enough voice for the planes taking off in Australia to hear, you have got to be kidding me. I don't recall anything else she said, or anything about the rest of that flight, to be honest. But every time I think about getting on a plane, my heart starts to race, I begin to sweat, and nausea overcomes me. Lisa? I forgot about the ladies from the women's Bible study. We were at our weekly lunch out afterwards. 
Vaughn looked at me with raised eyebrows, a French fries poised to pop into her mouth. I'm sorry, what was the question? Will you and Pastor be coming to the ladies' auxiliary luncheon on Thursday? It's going to be potluck, and I'm bringing my meatballs, said Ruth. Mm-hmm. And she shrugged her shoulders, drawing her head down like a turtle, trying to get back into its shell. I'm going to make my brownies. Pastor loves them, said Vera with an impish grin. Mm-hmm. Well, if there's going to be meatballs and brownies, Pastor will want to be there, I said. <laughs> Are you sure that's all you want, asked Carol. I can buy you something if it's an issue. No, thanks. I'm good. I gave her the brightest smile I could muster while my brain registered the fact that the gaggle of girls was headed in our direction. Why had we sat so close to the door? Their laughter broke through the buzzing of the Bible study ladies' voices. One of them snorted, or was she making pig noises? I shifted uncomfortably in the wooden chair that was digging into my sciatic nerve. The voices faded and the bells mercifully jangled at last. I let myself breathe. Next week, we should go to Sally's Diner over on Comstock. They have the juiciest burgers and their fries are wonderful, said Yvonne. I nodded while taking another sip of my smoothie. Three, Ooh. two, one, done. Tina. Oh, Tina, you're killing me. No, it was very good, Tina. Yeah, it was very poor. The description of her getting into the plane into the seat. Uh, I, I'm so sad right now. Yeah, like I felt that emotion, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well done, Tina, as always. Very well. Yeah, you got lots of stuff going on in the comments um, here. Oh, Jason's doing Clifton Strings. Yeah, and Piper's the pig noises. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that made me laugh. Yeah, I totally felt that character down deep inside. So thanks a lot to you. So now I've made everybody nauseous. And now you've made everybody cry. Who gets to go next? Uh, let's go with Rhonda. Oh, okay. Well, this is uh, dedicated to Jamie because it's a drabble. And that's the only reason why. Wow, is it exactly 100 words? Exactly. Oh, yes. Yay, I okay. Impressed. I can't wait. I don't know. Well. It's not really a full story, but it's a hundred words. Okay. <laughs> Rhonda, stop apologizing. I'm sure it's awesome. I'm not apologizing. I'm just telling you. <laughs> okay. Marnie sat, fingers poised above the keyboard, ready to punch out the words of her great American novel. Her fingers were cramping, sitting there all poised while her brain wasn't cooperating. It was as if brain was giving fingers a silent treatment. Listen, brain, I said you wouldn't like that breakfast. But you know I want what's best for us. Brain's voice whined like a distant police siren. The green tea and avocado smoothie turned out exactly as would be expected. What's best for us is buying a new cookbook, feet piped up. I'm taking us to the bookstore immediately. The end. That's the best. Yes. You got involved at the very end. What is that? What did you say that was called? The hundred words? A drabble. (gasps) Yep. There are drabble contests that you can enter and you've got to have exactly a full story and a hundred words. Yeah. Well, I love that. We had a Drabble contest for our 100th episode this last summer. They are not easy. I was not happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had to do that in just 15 minutes. Good job, Rhonda. And you included the prim, prim sprunt. You included the prim sprunt. So good for you. <laughs> I I like no brain is talking in ideation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but your feet person. are an activator. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay, Jamie, let's hear your story. The green tea and avocado smoothie turned out exactly as would be expected, and the launch went off without a hitch. Soon the club was bringing in half a million dollars in memberships and an extra hundred grand a year in add-ons, including spa treatments like hot stone massage and Reiki. But that wasn't enough for Mitch, who had tasted victory in business and wanted more. He set his sights next on a dilapidated warehouse in his hometown, what he liked to call the old buggy whip factory. Propelled by the success of his gym venture, he scavenged enough capital to get the building, then ran a contest asking local entrepreneurs to submit their best business plan for a shot at having the building retrofit for his or her specific use. The contest did more for Mitch's hometown than anyone could have imagined. Press descended on the region in droves, filling the modest motels and restaurants to beyond capacity for the first time since they put the freeway ramp just north of town. Mitch had a difficult time selecting the winner, as several worthy pitches were made. Finally, it was the heartstrings which won out. A young boy had made a business upcycling donated war medals, scavenged from thrift stores and garage sales, into fishing lures. 
Someone ought to care something about what happens to these old things, the freckle-faced youth shrugged into the camera during his mom recorded and submitted audition video. Jimmy Milton was looking for a bigger place, desirous to upscale his manufacturing process. Looking through the boy's carefully crafted business proposal, complete with expertly detailed financial analysis and prototype pictures, Mitch smiled to himself and thought, it's the green tea and avocado smoothie all over again. Oh, I love how you ended that. I love that ending. That was great. Framing. Yes. That's such a strategic thing, by the way. Like that high strategic is always the land. It's about the landing. How do we get the story to where it lands? I love that. It's 100% Jamie. Yeah. Yes. It's shattering yeah. moment that she's all about the shattering moment. That's awesome. Thanks, yeah. guys. Appreciate it. Really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And the Piper says, LOL, business plan made yeah. it into your story. <laughs> We've been doing business plans back up for like weeks. Oh, I love that. I love that. I figured I figured that was uh, in there somewhere. That. Awesome. That was fun. Okay. Well, let's move on to our next segment, which is the what's next, which um, self-explanatory. We go around and we say what's next. So let's start this time with Jamie. Um, what's next for me? I actually uh, wrote it down. So can you give me a second? Go to someone else. Okay, what about you, Rhonda? Uh, what's next picking? is, well, antique, a festival this afternoon. But then oh, after that, um, Mom and I have a deadline for February 6th um, where the final scene will be written by then or maybe the 7th, but probably the 6th. But um, so I am doing like a pre-edit and I'm trying to catch up to her. So we're hoping on the seventh or sometime during that week by the 15th is what we have in our business plan um to do all the final polish and everything so we can send it out to a couple of our readers that's awesome. exciting Very yes exciting. okay right, Jamie, have, go back go just go jamie my first novel analog is still in editing but never fear i've been writing shorts just released the latest it's an audiobook and an ebook it's a quirky little tale called help wanted it's available now, wherever you get your audio, except for Amazon, because it's taking forever for them to publish stuff. But you can find the ebook or the audio other places where media is sold, but you don't have to spend any money on it at all. Sign up, www.writingshorts.net. You will get it as the freebie in March, and you'll get a bonus free ebook just for signing up. www.writingshorts.net. Okay, that is a great um, marketing. Yeah. Um, very presentation. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Yep. <laughs> mine, my commercial for me. <laughs> yeah, we well, you need to write all our commercials. My what's next is my friend who is a strengths coach has agreed to meet with me on Thursday, and we're going to pick apart mm -hmm. my personal strengths and figure out how I can be a successful author using my I mean. personal strengths. Oh yay! So I am really, and she's not going to charge me anything. We just have to have coffee at the church. So I am <laughs> That's excited. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to suggest too, just because you have several strengths that we've done. If you haven't watched the quick cast episodes on your individual strengths, highly, highly recommend those. I've watched them all. Yeah, I've watched oh, everyone good. else's too. <laughs> good. Oh, of course. In I was trying to of do course. a character bio for my antagonist, and I decided I was going to figure out his Clifton strengths. So I went and watched all the ones I think he is. Nice. <laughs> now, like Becca, do you have 10 videos done now, or are all of them? We on have. Almost all of them are done. We, I think we have about 11 that are left. So we've got 23 or 24 uh, that are done. We're releasing another three in the next two weeks. I'm hoping to have all 34 of them done by the end of the school year this and Becca, year. Can you just real quick, can you spell for listeners? You're saying quit. Can you just yes. really quickly spell out and talk about where they can find you? Because you're awesome. Q-U-I-T-C-A-S-T. Uh, quit cast on YouTube. Uh, and we do, we do a lot of, you know, writing related stuff. Uh, but also it's, um, we do each one of the individual strengths. The reason I suggested this to Tina was because um, we do one strength 
two coaches talk about it. And then we have three successful authors who come on and talk about how they utilize mm -hmm. it. Um, and so it's really helpful Wonderful. and very author specific. Um, and so the quit cast and I'll put a link. In, I have the, the YouTube up actually. I'll just put yeah. a link. Really quick Let us it. be your rainmaker, Becca. Send I lots know, of I'm love like, and money to Becca because. <laughs> just, yeah. I'm like, just watch the free videos. You don't have to pay us anything. <laughs> I can't wait for the communication one, especially since there's so few writers. I can't yeah, wait to see. We're recording it today. Oh, <gasps> awesome. Yeah. Oh, then get us to what writers, <laughs> like who my, my peeps are. I cannot wait. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'll tell you who we're having on just because, like, so Sarah McLean, uh, if any of you are historical writers, is yeah. high communication. And Andy Christopher, if any of you are contemporary readers, is uh, communication. Uh, and and uh, T.S. Valmond, who's a sci-fi writer. So it's going to be amazing. That's like, it's exciting. Gonna be Sounds amazing. Can't wait. Yeah. Piper says her uh, what's next is she's finishing her book, ordering the cover this weekend. Oh, so, yay, Piper. Jason says his what's next, going back to writing his story again. So excited mm -hmm. to get back to paper that I fixed a few plot points. That's Definitely. always, always fun. Yep. Love that. Um, so um, Teresa wants to know, do you find the quick cast on YouTube? I will put all of her links in there, but why don't you give her, give her the answer? Yeah, I'll put the link in really quick right now. I don't think our chat will allow you to put a link in it. It's oh, weird. that's okay. But I can put it in the show notes as soon as we finish so you guys can be able to get to it. Mm -hmm. So I'll just quickly do my what's next. Um, I am, I finished editing book three, so I'm taking the rest so of the year exciting. off. Oh, good for you. <laughs> the rest of the year? <laughs> okay. I know. I was like, no, okay. Not. That's a lie. Notice how I'm immediately like, okay. <laughs> We're supportive no matter what. Well, I'm not strategic oh, at all, like, right? So, so just whatever. No, I'm just kidding. So um, <laughs> starting next uh, Monday, I will be doing, uh, I'm going to keep working on that contemporary that I'm halfway through. So I'm going to keep writing that and I'm going to start editing book four. Like I'm going to get that all the way edited before I really even put any effort into um, the um getting book three out because I learned my lesson putting out the first two books and not having the next two ready. So we're going to do that that way. And so still writing, still editing and just plugging along. Going to have three books come out this year. That is on my business plan. So it's happening. Awesome. <laughs> well, all okay. right. Do we have anything else we need to say? Well, what's up for Becca this week? She's going yeah, in the studio to record, but what else? Uh, I have to re-release a book. So that's always kind of a, you know, challenge because we had to get a new cover and, you know, all the stuff. So mm -hmm. that's, that's basically what I'm doing for the next week, other than being on Clubhouse, which we will not talk about because I don't <laughs> need to talk about Clubhouse, but well, I'm done editing. I'm done editing it, number three. So yeah. I'm there. I'll see you over come, there. Becca, come in our chat next Friday and let us know how your goals went. Yeah. Yeah. I, and this is actually a pretty good time for me to, uh, to pop by. So, and I love YouTube, like just in general, YouTube is definitely the channel that I feel uh, the most comfortable on. So mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Gigi's glad you're taking the year off. Jen. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your woo Gigi. Appreciate it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well then this concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers podcast. Until next time, may your pen re be prolific, your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye, everyone. Bye.